Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Walter Lima. I am a professor. Of, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. I have a problem on my audio. One minute, please. Okay, I believe it's okay, it's okay. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Walter Lima. I am a professor at Federal University of Sao Paulo and I am also leading the Artificial Cognitive System Research Group. It's an honor to welcome Kim Baraka, an assistant professor on the tenure track in the department of computer science at the Free University of Amsterdam. King's scientific branch lies at the intersection of artificial intelligence and the human-robot interaction. Baraka is broadly interested in developing computational methods for transferring information and knowledge between human and robots to help one day achieve a mutual and benefic human robot relationship. These transfers can occur in the context of explainable robot behavior, robot human transfer for, of information, assistive settings, robot helping human or human helping robots to get to a goal, or through teaching interaction, transfer of knowledge with learning or teaching robotics. Baraka is currently as junior track assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the Free University of Amsterdam as part of the Social Artificial Intelligence Group before joining the Free University of Amsterdam. He was a postdoctoral fellow in the Socially Intelligent Machines Lab in UT Austin, USA. He holds a dual PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, USA, and the Instituto Superior Técnico in Lisbon, Portugal. Professor Baraka was invited to participate in this webinar due to his innovative work as I research in the field of robotics. My first contact with Professor Baraka's works was through the paper and extended framework for characterizing social robots. I have adopted this paper in my class about artificial cognitive systems. Also with us in this webinar, Rodrigo Ferreira de Souza. He is a student in in the disciplinary professional master's program in technology innovation at Federal University of Sao Paulo. He has a degree in industrial electronics and manufacturing automation from College Senai, Sao Paulo, graduation in pedagogy, e, uh, also. He has worked in solid technology since 2014, there uh, where he holds uh, the position of head of technology. There are colleagues. The script for the webinar will be first lectured by Professor Baraka. So we open to debate uh, with uh, direct questions to Professor Baraka uh, by Rodrigo Souza. Uh, then we will open for questions 
from the audience by YouTube chat. So please send question to Baraka through this chat. Having said that, I am pleased uh, to invite Professor Baraka to give his lecture entitled Artificial Intelligence for Human-Robotic Interaction, Steps Towards a Symbolic Relationship Between Human and Machine. Welcome, Professor Baraka. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lima. Thank you, Rodrigo, for the kind introduction and no invitation. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so thank you again for the invitation. Um, I will uh, quickly share my screen and get started with my presentation. Um, so uh, as uh, Professor Lima already hinted at, I'm going to be talking about uh, AI for HRI or human-robot interaction. And I'm going to try to uh, structure this talk a little bit around some of the research that I've done during my PhD and some of the newer independent research lines that I've been developing as a faculty member uh, here in Amsterdam. Um, and I want the focus of this talk to be a little bit be uh, on the interaction between, of course, human and machine, but I want to focus on this idea of symbiosis or symbiotic relationship. Um, and so uh, just to sort of briefly uh, go into some details about uh, my journey uh, to uh, human-robot interaction, um, I started out as a uh, electrical and computer engineer um, in my hometown in Beirut, um, where I studied for uh, four years, um, did a very short internship um, as a summer student at, at CERN, uh, the, the Center for European Nuclear Research, uh, where I had some dreams of becoming one day a physicist. But very quickly, I realized that um, I was much more inclined to do things that require some level of creativity. Um, so instead, I ended up um, going for um, robotics um, during my master's uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do robotics is because it's one of these very few fields um, in science that lets you uh, pick and choose methods and ideas from very different fields. Um, so as a robotics engineer, you need to know a little bit about mechanics. You need to know a little bit about computer science, a little bit about um, uh, engineering and mechatronics. And so I was really fascinated by this idea of not having to belong to a single field, but really um, sort of juggle um, seamlessly between uh, different expertise and different um, disciplines and, and, and fields of research. Um, I then went on to do my PhD in human-robot interaction, um, which was a dual degree between um, Instituto Superior Técnico in Lisbon, um, where I learned some Portuguese, but not enough to give you the lecture today in Portuguese, um, and, and Carnegie Mellon. Um, I graduated in uh, 2020 uh, during the pandemic, which wasn't ideal. Um, I did a very short postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin um, uh, before moving to the Netherlands to uh, start my own uh, line of research as an assistant professor. So I would like to start um, this um, um, lecture or this talk uh, by introducing you to one example of what I would consider um, a first step towards a symbiotic relationship between uh, humans and robots. Um, this is a video from uh, Carnegie Mellon. This is the robot that I used for my master's thesis when I was there. Um, it's called the Cobot Robot. And I'm not going to say more. You're going to just watch the video. If there's a problem with the sound, if you can't hear the sound, can you just interrupt me and let me know? But I think it should be OK. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, watch this for a second. Meet Cobot, short for Collaborative Robot. You might call it Help on Wheels. I have to tell you that many people have done moving robots and others continue, everybody does. But the thing that is actually beautiful about also Cobot is that nobody follows Cobot. It just goes by itself. With support from the National Science Foundation, computer scientist Manuela Veloso and her team at Carnegie Mellon University are developing Cobot as an autonomous indoor service robot to interact with people and provide help on the go. 
And a key to its success is symbiotic autonomy, knowing when and where to ask humans for help, like pressing buttons in the elevator. So I press seven. And searching the web when asked about an object it doesn't know. Bring me a hamburger. This object is not in my knowledge base. I will search the web using... So when can you expect to see a cobot rolling down a hall near you? Belozo sees lots of opportunities. But even she wonders, are we really ready? We could be have cobots in supermarkets. We could have cobots in museums. We could have cobots in hospitals. We could have cobots in schools. Whether people generally will be able to accept a moving thing that moves by itself and interacts with you, I don't know psychologically how far away we are from that. Not a problem for me. Send it on over. I've got a long to-do list. And, well, I could use the help. All right. So this is a very clear example of um, how we could start thinking about the relationship between human and machine with a very specific and concrete but very elegant example, which is that you have a robot that is limited, right? All, all robots have limitations. And instead of thinking of these limitations as things that we just have to deal with, you can think of these limitations as opportunities for humans to step in and help the robot. The same way the robot helps the human, that you can have really this symbiotic relationship between what the humans can do and what the, um, the robots can do. Now, to motivate a little bit better um, why and where and how uh, robots uh, are developed in our society, um, I'm assuming not all of you are uh, necessarily in the field of robotics. Um, I'm showing here some excerpt from the paper that uh, Professor Lima already talked about, which is called an extended framework for characterizing social robots. So if you're interested in social robotics specifically, and you would like a, a, a gentle introduction to the field, I would recommend um, looking at uh, that paper. Um, I'm showing on the left a few different application areas where robots have already been deployed or are expected to be deployed in the next few years. And you can see that the types of robots, uh, you know, range from um, stuffed animals with some motors all the way to uh, robot manipulators that are, you know, really big, but maybe designed to be safe around humans. Um, you have robots that are uh, meant to not enter in contact with people. And then you have robots that are only meant to interact with people through contact. Like, for example, this uh, Robear, which is a, a robot meant to carry patients in hospital. Um, and you can also see the range of appearances of these robots, right? You have robots that really look um, more or less humanoid, or at least have a face or social features. And you have others um, like these over here that really look like machines, right? There are functional robots. There are a bunch of mechanical parts that are put together. But that doesn't mean that they cannot interact with people and they can, that they cannot have um, a social interaction, even though they do not um, resemble humans in any shape or form. And here on the right, I'm showing a um, diagram that we came up with that shows the different roles that uh, robots could have in relation to you, which represents the user here. Um, so, you know, you can have robots for you, uh, robots that, you know, uh, achieve a service or, or provide a service, um, such as the cobot robot that I've shown you in the previous slide, but also maybe an autonomous car. Um, you have robots with you, which is kind of the grand vision of collaborative robots, uh, thinking of you know robots in a factory that are collaborating with workers to achieve these mechanical tasks together, um, and you have robots around you. Think about you know this cobot robot that goes around the building and encounters people along the way, right? How does the robot you know need to deal with these people, right? Um, and then we have other types of robots, like robots as you, for example, right? Thinking on uh, thinking of the La Presence robot, for example, so thinking about Zoom, but on a robot, right? The Zoom on wheels, where the robot basically represents you in a, in a remote space. So you can see that the range of these different roles um, really calls for this notion of coexistence, right? And, and sharing space between humans and robots. So as a field of robotics, we need to move away from thinking of robotics just as an engineering problem and start thinking of the ecosystem in which these robots are meant to exist and in which they're meant uh, or they're designed for, right? So that means first understanding the, the people that are in the environment um, and then designing technology that takes people not just into account, but that puts people at the center of this uh, design uh, effort, this design endeavor. 
So elaborating on this idea, I'm really interested in this intersection between human and robot and the lens, um, or, uh, let's say the lens through which I look at the problem of human robot interaction is through the lens of learning um, through human interaction. So my research is particularly focused on how robots could play the role of learners, but also of teachers when interacting with humans. Because I believe that you know, beyond simple interaction, there's a huge opportunity for robots to become better at what they do by getting input from humans, but also there's opportunities for robots to teach people things uh, that they might not know, or for robots to assist people in things that they're not expert at. So at the intersection of this uh, human and robot sphere, I'm interested, of course, in interaction, I'm inter interested in learning, and I'm interested in teaching. And from each of the parts of the, you know, the human and the robot, um, I need to be curious about uh, certain fields or certain bodies of knowledge to be able to um, tackle these problems in a way that is um, not just considered an engineering problem. And so this means collaborating with psychologists, looking at insights from human factors, looking at methods for cognitive or behavior modeling, working with human data sets. And then from the robot side, really looking at the types of artificial intelligence techniques that can be used in this particular context, specifically focus, focusing on machine learning techniques, but also looking at things like mechanics and control and sort of low, lower level um, movement related uh, knowledge in the field. So I like to think of my research as this idea that robots and humans can teach and learn through social interaction. And this to me is, a, is the ultimate form of symbiosis that you can have between uh, humans and robots uh, coexisting together. Um, and I'm very inspired by how humans interact together in my research. Um, so if you think about how you know, parents teach their kids how to you know, perform some tasks or to learn about the world, you can think of this problem of uh, teaching as a transfer of knowledge or skill from an agent that is considered an expert, like the parents, to an apprentice, which would be the child in this particular case. Um, and if you look at the types of interactions that teachers use to uh, teach you know, uh, children or students or learners in general, that includes also you know, non-human animals, such as dogs, for example, um, you can see that the, um, the variety of uh, modalities of interactions that these people use is huge. Um, and so, you know, it ranges from speech to gestures to much more subtle things like touch or contact to how you distance yourself from the person, the facial expressions, other subtle cues like gaze. Um, and what we have in, in robotics nowadays is, is, is very far from that, right? Uh, we mostly have artificial interfaces such as, you know, tablets, um, keyboards, and that kind of stuff to control what robots do. Um, and ideally, we would want to develop much more usable interfaces to be able to have users have more control and more flexibility on how they use these robots. So I like to think about interaction between a human and robot in a bi-directional way. Um, and in the first part of this talk, I'm going to briefly overview some work that I've done on robots playing the role of a teacher, so the robot teaching the human. And in the second part of the talk, I'll reverse that. So I'll talk about my recent work on having uh, robots learn from people or humans teach robots. Um, so to get started with this idea of robot teachers, um, I would like to talk about two types of um, uh, human on, on, the, on the right side. So the first one would be uh, human learners. Um, and by human learners, I mean that you're in a typical educational setting. Um, this is a very particular example because we worked for uh, about two years with uh, children with autism. Um, and uh, these children were, um, you know, uh, invited to interact with a robot and the robot was uh, going through some interactive tasks. So it would tell a story. And then within the story, it would use some social cues to be able to uh, communicate with the child certain actions that it expected the child to do, like looking at the screen, for example. Um, and the research here was about how do we make this robot adaptive and socially intelligent such that it can reason about the impairments that these children have. Um, so one of the very uh, important things in autism research is that every child with autism is its own case, is its own person. 
we often have a saying that says, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So this is really to say that each one of those uh, kids, which are users of the robots, are extremely different. And this is a very challenging problem for a robot to be able to understand these different um, uh, ways of interacting with children that have very, very different uh, uh, behavioral responses to these, these types of robots. And so the idea here was that uh, the robot had to find a balance between assisting um, the child too little, um, where, you know, this is called under assist, um, and also not over assisting the child, right? So think about this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know how to bike. Um, if you live in the Netherlands, you definitely know how to bike because that's your main mo mode of transportation. Um, but if you remember the first time that you rode a bike or when you were a kid and maybe one of your parents was teaching you how to bike, um, you remember maybe that the person would, you know, provide some assistance physically by touching you, uh, touching the seat on the back. And, you know, if the, the parent is overly protective and, and over assists you, then you're never learning, right? And if the parent is under assisting you, not providing enough uh, input, then you're not being challenged enough, right? So where you want to be is you want to provide this just right level of assistance, which both, you know, makes the learning environment safe, but also challenges you enough to be able to learn. And this is exactly what we thought is also relevant in socially assistive, se assistive settings, where the assistance that was given was not a physical one, but a social one. So this had to do with <clears throat> the, type, the types of things that the um, robots had to say, the types of gestures that the robots could give, um, and that sort of stuff. And here I'm showing a few examples of other domains that belong to what we call social assistive robots. So how does, does this look like? Um, given a hierarchy of actions that the robot could take, this is an example from a speech therapy, the higher the number, the more assistive is this action, right? So if someone needs to uh, recover a certain word that they forgot, uh, maybe the first thing to say is to give them directions on the function of the item. So if it's a phone, then you say, yeah, it's something that you use to call. And if you want to give them really the, the, the extra assistance, then maybe you will, you will just say what it is, or you will, you would tell them the first uh, few letters or the first few syllables and have them, um, uh, complete, complete the word. So the question is given this hierarchy of actions, whether it's for uh, speech therapy, autism therapy, or any other kind of assistive setting, how should a robot sequentially adjust its level of assistance over multiple trials and over longer uh, interactions? Um, and so we had a mathemat mathematical model where we formalized this problem by using probabilities of success of certain actions as well as costs. And the cost was one of the hardest things because one, once you want to uh, model something that is very complex, such as a um, value, the value of a certain therapeutic action, you really need to go and understand what's going on behind behind the scenes and try to come up with um, numbers that can represent these more abstract concepts. And so without going into too many uh, details on the approach, what we ended up doing is um, estimating these parameters that I talked about in the previous slide um, using some data that we collected in a user study with these kids. And then the robot was able to generate these adaptive sequences which would be different for different profiles of children, right? So depending on the severity of autism, you would see different sequences being generated for different tasks and for different children, which showed that um, the robot was able to adapt to a wide variety of children profiles. And we also were able to prove that the algorithm that we came up with would align with some best practices that therapists use. All right. So this was the first um, example from my uh, PhD research on robot teacher human learners. What I would like to go next is to think about the human, not just as a learner, but also as a potential teacher, right? And you can see here already that I'm cross-referring the role of teaching and learning, because I believe that any teaching interaction between humans is actually a co-teaching interaction that, uh, you know, teachers learn a lot by interacting with their students and that students learn how to teach better by learning. So it's, a, it's really a two-way street. 
And so the the project that um, was sort of the second part of my of my PhD thesis was to use robots not to um, provide therapy or or teach kids with autism, but to also train the teachers, which are the therapists, to perform better at the job. And so this was an opportunity for us to use the same tool, which was a humanoid now robot, to benefit very different target populations. And so the idea was that um, these therapists need to train how to properly diagnose um, a very complex uh, condition like autism. Um, and they do that through interaction. This is how it's done. It's not through any blood test or brain uh, scan. It's really through the standardized interaction that's very specific. They have a whole manual on how to go through different tasks that I'm showing here on the slide. And so the idea we came up with was that with this robot, although it doesn't look at all like a child, but at least it has the basic social capabilities that would allow the, the therapist to at least go through the mechanics of the interaction in a way that is first error tolerant, right? If the therapist messes up, um, they are able to repeat. Uh, or to, you know, uh, be if there's room for error, that it's also diverse because you can control uh, the type of profile of autism that you can have uh, on that robot, and you can repeat things as many times as you want, right? Whereas in a real setting, uh, you have no room for errors, you are limited by real cases, and it's a one-shot type of thing, right? You only have one um, case that you can, you know, train on, and then that case is gone. So this is how it looks like. Um, we have a few features that we could play with, and those were taken from theories in psychology. The first one was uh, the level of language. The second one was the use of pointing. The third one was how the robot responded to joint attention. And the last one was how does the robot respond to the name? And I'm showing different examples. So the, this is an example of a um, low severity autism behavior that is uh, depicted on the robot. And then this is an, an example where the robot uh, doesn't respond in, in the same way. So this is a, let's say an emulation of autistic behaviors um, with high severity. So the, the robot only responds to touch. It has a touch sensor on its head. The robot doesn't respond to things like pointing or speech, but it only responds to the sound and it's able to detect where the sound comes from. And it responds um, very briefly on, um, using speech, so very simple uh, uh, language that doesn't have grammatical constructions. So I'm not going to go into details about how we were able to do this, but basically we took a tool from psychology and we reversed it to be able to emulate these behaviors on artificial systems such as robots. And if you're interested, I included some QR codes for you to check out the, the two papers that we've published on this uh, topic. All right, so to summarize, um, I've talked about two types of uh, human learners or, or human in, in the role, let's say, of a learner. Some that, some that are truly learners, uh, right? And others that are learning to be teachers, right? And I, I uh, presented you know, two focuses. One was on personalized teaching, which was about how the robot should adapt and personalize its teaching behavior to fit different user needs. And the second one was on how to use teaching as a way to, uh, uh, to do mock-up interactions, to train um, learners to perform better at what they're, they're doing um, in their professional jobs. Now, in the second part of the talk, uh, which is gonna be the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I would like to talk about um, my vision for sort of reversing that um, arrow, right? So um, most of the work that I've been doing in the past two years um, with my students has been on thinking about how can we think about, you know, robots that learn from people, right? So learning might mean that uh, a robot learns how to better perform at a task, or it could be that a robot learns the human preferences, right? So if I want my robot, um, I have a robot vacuum cleaner in my house, it's right there, I can see it. <laughs> I wish I was able to talk to it and tell it, do not go on this expensive carpet. Um, don't go there, right? But I can't do this because I can't talk to it and I can't go on my app and tell it not to go there. I maybe can, but it's kind of complicated. Um, but if your grandma had to talk to this robot and maybe she would talk to it like a dog or like, um, I don't know, some other pet, right? 
And so this is kind of the idea um, is to be able to have this more um, natural and spontaneous interaction with robots that are able to modify their behavior through interactive learning. Um, and there's a lot of work in that field from the algorithm side. So there is a field called learning from demonstration. Um, and I'm listing examples of uh, algorithms that, that fall within that umbrella term. Um, there's learning from evaluative feedback, which is basically a yes, no kind of thing. So if you're not able to tell the robot what to do, at least you can observe what the robot does and then you can tell it, hey, good job or hey, bad job. And this is a little bit how, you know, animals learn, right? You provide them with rewards and punishments and eventually they learn to optimize their behavior. Um, you also have learning from advice, which is giving, you know, advice on which actions to take, uh, but also corrective feedback where you tell, you know, the robot uh, what was the right thing to do if it's messed up. And so the main issue with these methods is that they exist in a sort of box that makes a lot of assumptions about how this feedback or how these demonstrations look like. Uh, most of the time they're assumed to be perfect or ideal, but also how these in, how this human input is provided um, is quite limited. It's limited to these artificial interfaces that look like you know buttons or a star rating. Uh, and they have very little to do with how we would naturally interact with um, another you know, human being or maybe an animal. Um, and in that sense, they really reduce the human to purely a source of unidimensional information. Whereas what I argue is that humans are actually a very rich source of know-how and that there's a lot that could be extracted from a rich, let's say, social signal that would come from the human teacher. And so I call this rich know-how that is communicated through explicit, but also implicit signals, right? So things like facial expressions, where you're looking and that kind of stuff are considered implicit signals and explicit signals would be things that are deliberately communicated. And those are mostly speech or some gestures that are very intentional, for example. I'd like to show what I think is a perfect example of a good human teacher that just illustrates how amazingly well we are as a species at um, teaching other people and, and, and doing that with a lot of passion and a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of expertise. And it's just so natural for us. Um, this is a um, interaction between a vocal coach and a, an opera singer. I'll let you enjoy this. Um, pay attention to the types of social signals you see. So you might see a lot of gestures. You might see a lot of a gazing, a lot of emotional expressions, uh, some touch, some um, other what we call kinesthetic feedback. So things that involve moving the body. So pay attention to the types of things that you see in this video and maybe come up with a few ideas that you would think, hey, I think it would be really cool if a robot would be able to pick up on that social signal and be able to learn from it. All right, let's enjoy. And... So, so you can see that this type of interaction has probably a 50 year uh, research plan in there to be able to have, you know, such a rich interaction. Um, but let's just say that it's a source of inspiration for uh, some of my research, um, starting with very simple things like uh, what we call prosody. Um, and prosody is a type of signal that exists in the voice that is not directly related to uh, speech. It has to do with the tonality of voice, the uh, pitch, the duration of speech, the, the, the tempo. 
And everything that is really about how you say something rather than what you say. Um, I'm going to let you listen to this participant in our study. Um, and um, yeah, and then we'll discuss uh, what, the, what the goal of the research for this project is. Up, 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 up. No. Up. No. 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 Okay, right. Keep on going. Right. Right, right, no, 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 right, up, 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 down. Right, so you can see that the types of words that the person was using was pretty much the same throughout. It was up, down, left, right, plus yes and no. But the way that the person was saying those was extremely different for uh, different states in the game, right? So when you would get closer to the bomb, maybe the tone of voice or the effective or the or the emotional expression would increase. And where you're in parts where, you know, maybe you go the wrong way, but it's not that much of a big deal, then maybe the, the tone of voice would be more neutral or something like that, right? So the idea would be that uh, we could develop an algorithm that is able to pick up not just on what the person is saying, but also use that implicit source of information that is carried in prosody and in voice um, and really think about the input as this rich, voice signal rather than just a transcription of the speech and that we hypothesize would actually increase the learning performance of the um in this case reinforcement learning agent so it's a it's an agent uh, that learns from the interaction with the environment plus the uh um you know voice input from the teacher and this is ongoing work with um some collaborators at ut austin as well as a master's student um working um this semester at the free, free university. Um, I'm also looking at multiple modalities of inter interaction to develop these more, uh, let's say, rich interfaces for what I call naturalistic teaching. Um, so, for example, we, you know, used um, some hands-on or some actually some, um, um, let's say, um, interfaces that allow you to provide demonstrations without having to physically touch the robot by, for example, using a ball as a way to guide the robot, uh, but also using things like gestures or speech-based adjustments to be able to refine the trajectories that um, these robots might have. And this is some initial work we did with a robot simulator. Um, we then applied it to the Pepper robot, which is this cute um, big cousin of the Now robot that you saw earlier. Um, but the idea is the same, is that we're trying to have um, more ways that people could go to these robots and communicate with them in ways that are more intuitive, more usable, and require less training and adaptation from the human. And this is an example of uh, some of the tools that we use. So on the left side, you have um, a tool called MediaPipe that is able to detect, you know, your actual uh, um, pose um, in, you know, um, 3D space, actually. So it also has a depth estimation. And on the right, I'm showing an example of what we call kinesthetic adjustments, which is this idea that as a robot is performing a task, you could interfere with it. And then through this uh, touch or, or pressure-based uh, feedback, give some hints to the robot on how to perform a task better. Um, now, what are the types of tasks that a robot can learn? You know, we've looked at very uh, sort of mechanistic tasks, such as handovers, pouring, or shooting a ball in a basket, but also more open-ended tasks, such as creative painting, where the robot needs to collaborate with the human, and where the human maybe shows the robot what to do or how they want the robot to do it, but also the robot takes initiatives. And that, you know, the robot sometimes surprises the human and is able to um, steer the collaboration towards something that enriches the synergy between the human and the robots. So the conclusion is that, you know, there's a wide array of tasks that we can learn. Of course, these tasks depend on the robot embodiment, the capabilities of the robot. But the key idea is that different tasks call for very different types of interactions and very different types of learning algorithms. And through both education and teaching and uh, research, um, I've been able to explore multiple ideas on how I see this happening. So some students of mine right now are working on, you know, gesture control, uh, choreography, where they're able to sort of teach a robot how to perform a certain dance. And then these dances are stored as sequences. 
other people have worked on using um, you know, speech-based interactions to be able to teach concepts to the robot. So it's really a, such, a, such a wide and rich space to explore. Um, and if you have any, any uh, you know, uh, crazy ideas or things you would really like to do and you're a researcher, um, then please come to me and we can have a talk. Of course, there are a lot of open research questions um, that I'm also interested in, um, in answering in the next few years. Um, one of them being how to learn from multiple types of interactions, how to adapt to different teaching styles by, by modeling teachers, how to improve the quality of human teaching actively through feedback and instructions from the robot, but also how to learn more open-ended or evolving interactive tasks so that these tasks do not have to be maybe defined before the teaching happens, but they could be collaboratively defined through interaction and I'm showing two examples of projects where this was really the case. The first one on the left is a, a contact improvisation dance that involved a robot uh, responding to dancers' movement. This was a collaboration with some dancers in Portugal. And on the right, I'm showing a collaborative painting, which was basically a game between a robot uh, haptic device and a human painter, where they had to collaboratively um, uh, act on a, pen on a, on a paintbrush. Um, and this was a very interesting type of interaction because the collaboration happened at every instant, right? And it did not use any speech or any other forms of uh, communication. The only form of communication was through pressure and, um, and touch. And the general question that I would like to sort of end with um, before moving on to one last thought is uh, how can humans and robots co-learn from each other, right? Uh, but not just from each other, but also from the environment and over multiple interactions, right? So these robots are meant to be, you know, in our lives in the near future, uh, maybe be in our homes. We already have vacuum cleaners in our homes. We have manufacturing robots in, in uh, factories. Uh, we have drones that we use for cinematography, for uh, uh, leisure. Um, and there will be more of these robots, right? And some of them we are actually interacting on an extended um, time frame with, right? So it is only a missed opportunity if we don't go into thinking how to endow these machines with capabilities to be able to um, acquire more flexibly new skills and also personalize and refine existing skills to better match what users expect from these robots. And in that way, we're actually empowering users to have more control over their technological tools. Now, before ending this, I would like to spend five more minutes on a topic that's uh, quite dear to my heart because I'm actually a dancer. Um, I've been professionally dancing uh, since 2008. Um, and I strongly believe that uh, art actually has a, a very important role to take in future development of technology and specifically in robotics. Um, so I'd like to quickly talk about uh, a few projects that I've been doing uh, related to merging robotics and dance. Uh, we have an article um, that I'm linking uh, well, I have the, the title on, the, on, on top. There's also a link to the project that is funding this research. It's called Acting Like a Robot. Um, and we also had an installation at one of the dance festivals here in the Netherlands, where we had a robot play movement games <clears throat> with people in the festival. So people would get in a room, would meet the pepper robot that you see on this picture, and would play these very very simple but very fun movement games where the robot would have to take certain actions to engage the human and we were looking at different aspects of engagement um and so if we look back at this uh intersection between the human and the robot that i showed before actually a lot of the research that i've been uh, doing is secretly sort of motivated by dance problems and choreography problems um, so looking at the human, I'm actually very interested in, um, you know, how does a choreographer instruct dancers, right? Um, sometimes it makes a lot of sense, sometimes not so much. And there's its own logic and its own very rich way of communicating. How can we make sense of that? Um, on the learner side, how does a dancer think or behave, right? How do we model how dancers take input from the choreographer and, and make it their own and somehow uh, bring this aspect of collaboration? On the robot side, how can a robot learn from a choreographer, for example, right? We actually worked a lot with uh, choreographers, dancers, and puppeteers in some projects 
because we believe that they have the expertise to bring something to the table, be it, you know, um, some knowledge about how movement should look like, um, knowledge about what actions the robot should be taking to engage. Um, so actually this is insights from improvisation, improvisational dance. Um, how can a robot dance together with a human dancer, right? How can we have this collaborative dance or this collaborative social interaction where um, there might not be a goal, right? There might not be this very strictly defined um, idea of performance or efficiency. Um, and I'm showing here some examples of what I consider to be very um, smart dancers that are making very subtle choices um, in a dance called contact improv, um, which I showed something very, very restricted of that with the robot earlier um, in, the, in the video with the, uh, with the dancers in Portugal. And those are some more um, videos uh, to help me illustrate my point. I'd like to end um, by making you aware of a, an amazing consortium that is happening right now in the Netherlands. It's a 10 year uh, grant project. It's called the Hybrid Intelligence Center. And I think um, what we're looking at in this consortium is really at the center of this idea of symbiosis between humans and robots um, and looking at the different roles that people and robots could have or just generally AI could have in our society and looking at models of intelligence that combine human and machine intelligence and expand the human intellect instead of replacing it, as has been the case for many types of AI development. Um, if you're interested, you can scan this um, QR code or you can go to uh, hybridintelligence.org, um, I think, or .nl. Uh, you can Google it, it's very easy to find um, and look at some of the research activities that we've been uh, uh, looking at. This is it for me. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and thank you again for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have, and I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baraka. Um, thank you very much for this amazing lecture. Amazing, amazing. Now, uh, I open the room for Rodrigo Souza to ask his questions to Professor Baraka. Well, thank you, Walter and Baraka for your amazing uh, lecture here. It was very, very impressive, the, all of the work that you are having done. And for a start, uh, some notes me from, from those questions. Uh, first, I, I want to start with uh, when you talk about the systems of uh, the, the relation those students and interactions with the, the robots. Um, why do these students are learning or interacting with the robots? How you could monitoring uh, the effectivity of the learning? Uh, what aspects do you are watching or looking to understand if they are better or they are improvers themselves in, in those classes, for example. Are you talking about the example with the children with autism? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and that's one of the, the things that was really, um, let's say, practically difficult um, because there are very specific tests that you can do um, with with these kids um, and they require a, quite some effort um, depending on what you're working on right but um, generally you know in in the type of research that i was doing in my phd i was actually not um, looking specifically at teaching and learning back then i was focusing more on the interaction itself um, and we were looking at immediate responses as a way to show whether or not the robot did the right thing or if it could have done it better um, but that's a it's a very good question because this is typically one of the things that we need to think about, right? How do we uh, measure the, the actual efficacy of what the robot does in the long term, right? Um, and actually part of the bigger project that, um, or the bigger project that, that was funding my PhD was actually looking at exactly that. They were doing um, longer term studies. I think it was about a month and a half of an intervention. We only, uh, my, my project only lasted a single session. so there wasn't, um, let's say, any 
changes in performance that one would expect. But for this longer study, they did have an assessment by the therapists before the intervention and then after the intervention. And they also had a control group. The control group would just go through the normal therapy. And of course, you know, uh, kids do get better with therapy. Um, so what they did is they compared, you know, the group that had the normal therapy plus the robot, or it was the, the normal therapy plus the robot inside, embedded inside the, the, the usual therapy session. And then the group without the robot, and they were able to show um, a difference between those two groups, right? So this is typically how, how you would do it. Now, it would be amazing if the robot could do that assessment as it goes, right? That you wouldn't have to have a human come in every time and then do this whole assessment, but that the robot could somehow get maybe not a super accurate idea, but some idea about the progress of the child, right? And be able to adapt its learning by looking at how the child learns and what it could do better. And this is, I think, a very open uh, research question. Um, and I think education is, in general, is a very fascinating uh, use case for um, applying these types of uh, technologies because um, it's a very complex problem and no learner is the same. And also assessment is a very difficult thing, right? I mean, we're still doing research on how humans should be teaching other humans, right? We haven't figured that part out. So let alone what we could do with robots. Yeah, great, great. Thank you for your answer. Um, another question that uh, I'm having thinking here when you are, are doing your lecture. Um, I'm seeing that in some, some cases you are using the Android robot or like Pepper. So uh, what makes you cho choose any kind of robot to, to make some, some kind of uh, research in, in, uh, in the physical body or using software or, or screen? Uh, what are the this kind of aspects that you you needs to use to do make the selection for this case that you I need to use this kind of robot or no for this other or the situation I need you another kind of uh, robot like uh, the, the arms to dance uh, in some yeah. some cases um yeah that's an interesting question um the the sort of obvious answer is um i i just choose what i have <laughs> and it's uh, very very expensive um, so, yeah. you know, when I was in the U.S., you know, we had this uh, cobot robot that was the one I was supposed to use. And then in Portugal, they had a lot of now. So we then used the now. Uh, now I just got a robot arm. So now we're using arm. So there's a lot of stuff where we just have to start with a robot and see what we can do with it uh, for very sort of practical purposes. Um, but in an ideal world, I mean, if I had a catalog of, of, of like 100 robots that I could choose from or if I could design my own robots, which actually happened for the autism project, they designed their own robots for the long-term study, then you can really think about um, everything from the appearance all the way to the behavior of the robot. Um, and, and I think the paper that I mentioned, the extended framework paper, uh, is a good starting point to, to think about these design decisions, right? Um, so the first thing that I think a lot of people ask me about is, why do these robots look human or human-like, right? So why do they have a face? Why do they have arms? Of course, not all of them do. Um, I've worked, I mean, if you look at the, the haptic device that paints with you, it, it doesn't have any, let's say, fancy social behavior. But even just pushing is a form of social behavior, right? Um, it's a way of communicating um, in a way that people also do, right? People communicate a lot through touch. If you look at how blind people um, navigate in a in a in a an open space, um, touch plays a very big role. Um, so those are all things that um, you would have to ask yourself depending on the, the problem. Um, one project that we're working on right now is inspired by dog trainers, how trainers, uh, dog trainers, you know, train animals, dogs specifically. Um, and we're applying these uh, concepts of dog training to the robots we have. Um, and the robots we have are humanoid robots for the most part. Um, and so one of the questions was like, well, but this looks more like a human, not a dog. So why would you apply this to a human? And, and the question, the, the, yeah, so the, the, the answer here is that even if those, you know, look a bit more like human, uh, depending on what kind of behaviors they have, that will shape the perception you have of these robots completely, right? So if the robot doesn't speak at all, 
and it uses maybe some cute sounds, maybe you will see it more as an animal than you would see it as, let's say, a simulated human being. I mean, robots are not simulated human beings. They are machines and they can have social capabilities, but that should really be about improving the interaction and not uh, deceiving people into thinking that they are more than what they actually are. And this is kind of the standpoint that we've been taking. So whenever we use robots that evoke certain things, we make sure that we, through the interaction and the behavior of the robot, that we align people's expectations of what the robot can do or is supposed to be doing in that context with what the robot actually would be doing. Okay, okay. You give me uh, a lot of insights here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my, my last question is uh, about your last uh, talking uh, about the, the dancing, dancing robots. So mm -hmm. I'm see that you are a professional from dancing. So uh, that, that is an amazing uh, look to you and to see uh, these two words in your head and understand uh, uh, a lot of amazing uh, jobs that you are doing here. So when we reflect about dancing, it's a very introspective uh, uh, moment in your head to express yourself in your physical and in, in, could, uh, uh, get that information from your perceptions and uh, give them to give, give this uh, behavior to to robots. What kind of areas or segments from the uh, research we are open here? Because I have the in the past uh, opportunity to talk with uh, Eric Araujo from uh, uh, the, your team from research, uh, also from Brazil. And they talk to me uh, the other uh, side from the, this kind of uh, research that we can open some, some fields that uh, is more deep in the human behavior. But when you're talking about dancing, what kind of, of doors we are opening here? So do you, do you mean, is your question about what um, disciplines we, sh we are looking into when we go down that direction? Or uh, is it more about the actual research problems? I think there is uh, more when we can compare the, the machines in the symbiosis relationship with, between humans and how level of uh, human behavior we can uh, sent to uh, a robot like dancing or, or, or other stuff. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I would say the first the first disclaimer is that, you know, we we don't have the intention of, you know, having a robot that um, simulates what a dancer does or replicates what, what a dancer does. Um, the, the first, and if you look at the name of the project that, that we're currently doing, it's called acting like a robot and it's, it's not called, it's, it's not called acting like a dancer or acting like an actor, uh, because it's really about looking at how a robot would act and what does that mean, right? That's the sort of overarching question and really starting with what the robot can do and then maybe bringing insights from other fields, so performance uh, and design and puppetry and dance into robot interaction design, right? Um, so it's less about studying dancer uh, cognition or choreographer cognition and trying to replicate that on dancers, but it's rather looking at how can robots be there to um, create interesting um, opportunities for performance and also more importantly for me, how can insights from you know, this field be used to advance the field of AI and robotics in general, right? So if you think about social interaction, I see social interaction as a social dance, right? You have multiple actors, they're interacting together. There's a great deal of improvisation. There's a great de deal of using your past knowledge. It's just a way of looking at things from a different perspective. Um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing has actually been on 
um, taking some theories and some concepts from these fields and using them as a starting point. That's the first one. The second one is actually using the expertise of professionals in the field to help us design certain things or make choices. And what we do is we do co-design sessions. So we'll have workshops and we'll bring these people in the same room and we'll tell them, hey, we have this great idea, but we have no idea or no clue where to go. And you need to help us to make this a reality. And so we bring in puppeteers, interaction designers, animal behaviorists, dog trainers, whatever it is, right? We bring this expertise together and we make it happen. And then the third one is people might not know. So what we can do is we collect data. So we tell them, um, you know, just control the robot the way you think is natural and they would do it. And then we just collect the data that they got and we don't try to explain it. Then we can just use it to train a machine learning algorithm or maybe we can do some analysis, but we assume that this knowledge is implicit, that they're not able to actually talk about it explicitly. So those are three ways that we've been looking at it. And each of those ways is very different, but it's somehow all uh, built on each other, right? Um, so I hope I'm answering your question, um, but if, if, if you have a more specific question about a specific project or a specific type of expertise, I'd be happy to um, give some more details. No, okay, it's very clear for me from, from this moment. Um, I will give the words from the Professor Walter. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Thank you. Dear uh, Rodrigo, thank you very much for this important interaction. More so, given that Professor Baraka covered topics that are closely relevant to his dissertation, it's very important. Okay. Now I open the question session to the audience via YouTube chat. Professor Baraka, we have many questions. Many questions. Great. Great. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I must be uh, just a few of them because of time. Okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. First, Livia Sukazas asks um, where she can find more material about what the professor said about the robot, uh, which interacts with autistic children and about the bicycle more yeah event. so if you're interested in that particular work um you can go to my website i have a publication section and you can find the relevant publications um there's also um, a lot of uh surveys on, on the issues or just in general uh, there's a, a, a sort of seminal paper um, on the topic which is called um Robots for Autism Research or something like that. It's by Brian Scassolati. So if you just Google Robots for Autism, there's going to be a lot coming up. But if you're interested specifically in the work on the, 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 the bicycle motivation, um, then I invite you to look on my website for the... I have a few publications and you can access the PDFs without having to go through a, a paywall. Okay. Another question. Houdini Andrea Welter. Our students, colleagues uh, uh, of Rodrigo and uh, Professor Baraka, I would like to ask you, what is your opinion about autonomy as a vector in the process of human-robot symbiosis? How you you describe the concept of autonomy in this cognitive process? That's a really good question. Um... I would invite you to take a look at the extended framework uh, paper that I mentioned a couple of times already. Um, the short answer would be that the concept of autonomy as traditionally defined, um, so autonomy in robotics is typically thought of, you know, the more the autonomy, um, the less interaction there is uh, with, with a human. Uh, obviously, when you're in an inter in human robot interaction, or if you're thinking of the symbiotic uh, relationship between humans and robots, this is obviously not the case, right? So if if the, the thing that the robot needs to be good at is to interact with another human, then obviously you cannot say that an autonomous robot is meant to not interact with a human, right? That's a contradiction. Um, so in in the paper, we we sort of have a small uh, nuance where we say instead of thinking about interaction or lack of interaction um, as autonomy increases that we have a, a lack of intervention um, and the difference is that 
intervening means that you're taking over what the robot is supposed to be doing. Um, and, and that's an important distinction, right? So you can have a completely autonomous social robot, or you can have a partially autonomous social robot. That's actually something that I've been doing a lot in my research. Um, if we're interested in the interaction and we don't care about having a super fancy, let's say computer vision solution or some other perception system, then maybe we can have a wizard, which is basically a person behind a curtain, observing the interaction and then telling the robot what is happening without having to rely on an autonomous solution, right? So this idea of autonomy then becomes, um, often people talk about shared autonomy, uh, especially for assistive um, applications where part of the autonomy is on the robot and part of the autonomy is on the user. Um, but instead of it being on a single spectrum, you have multiple dimensions of control, right? Um, so you can think about how to create, this is also the notion of hybrid intelligence, right? If you think about collaboration and symbiosis, the idea of autonomy kind of fades away, right? Because then you have to think more at the level of the team and the interaction and the structure, um, as opposed to just thinking about, oh, I have a robot that is on Mars or some remote planet and they need to be autonomous. We need to just put them there and then forget them, right? Um, so some ideas from autonomy, I think, still apply a lot to HRI, but a lot of them, I think, need to be rethought. Um, I hope, again, this answers um, the question you had. Um, autonomy also means very different things in other fields. So I responded to that question from the perception of, from the perspective of robotics. See, next, uh, Wellington Ferreira, another research group colleague. And uh, Wellington asks, would you like to hear Baraka visions Baraka's visions about uh, open AI models. Will it support human robotic symbiosis field? Um, uh, the, the, the short answer is definitely. Um, I mean, these are tools that we are already starting to use um, for our research, right? Um, now, you know, whether these, so this is also, uh, I think, a clear example where. Um, academia and industry are sort of in a, in a sort of battle or a, a weird relationship where um, the resources are not equally, um, uh, when I say resources, it's mostly data and computational power that are not equally spread across um, people who own the knowledge or own the tools. So we end up using a lot of tools from OpenAI, uh, from Google and from other um, companies uh, to develop our uh, solutions for interaction. Um, but we also, especially with, you know, chat GPT recently that sort of created this whole uh, wave, um, we're forced to think a lot about, um, the role of AI and the role of these tools in our research and also in our teaching. Right. So even just thinking about writing research papers, and there's already these papers that are co-authored with chat GPT, where the, it actually appears in the list of authors. Uh, for our students, we're already encouraging students to use these tools, but to then have a reflection paragraph that says, okay, you know, you've generated this with AI, what is wrong about it? What is right about it? And why? Right? And then we would care more about that. Um, at least for now, you know, the tool itself cannot do that about itself. Um, so anyway, so all these developments, I mean, they, they, they of course, enable things to happen. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, I think of us as primarily designers, even if we're designing algorithms, we're still designers. And as designers, we make choices, we make decisions that are based on a problem we're trying to solve, right? So if we have more tools, that's great. Is it always a good idea to use them? No, right? If we think that using a particular tool doesn't make sense in a particular context, then we'll just not use it, right? If we have a very fancy algorithm that does something very fancy, but just using a simple decision tree would do the trick and would make it more transparent to, I don't know, a child that is trying to learn about a specific concept. Then we just use this decision tree that was developed decades ago. We don't need to go for the fanciest deep learning classifier, right? Um, so yes, more advances definitely allows for more possibility, but it doesn't mean that it solves more problems necessarily, right? It's really this design thinking that 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 is needed i think the most at this point in time and that we need to think critically about uh, the systems we develop and the problems we're solving 
Great. I have a question. Kami Legend. <laughs> And uh, Professor Baraka, do you see a limit to the advancement uh, of AI since um, factors such as our brands has several functionalities that at first glance seem very far from the understanding of AI? Uh, you broke up a little bit, but I have the comment here, so I'm going to read it here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a very broad question, and I think it relates to the uh, to the idea of artificial general intelligence. Um, so one of the things that so so the the fundamental assumption that I like to take about AI is that AI is not artificial human intelligence, right? Um, it is artificial intelligence, right? So it's about um, creating a form of intelligence that could be inspired by humans, that could be aiming at do things that humans do, but it doesn't have to be doing things that human already can do. In fact, there are a lot of things that AIs do very well, like analyzing tons of data, which is something that something that you know humans just cannot do. Um, and there's things that we would want AIs to do uh, that humans can do very well, like sensory motor uh, stuff, like really. We, you know, a pigeon is much better at that than is the most advanced AI. Um, but so so to answer the question, I would say that um, obviously there are a lot of, uh, let's say, functionalities, as you call them, in our brain that are maybe very difficult to replicate in an artificial system. Um, but it might be that um, it's maybe not something we would want to implement in the first place. Or maybe there are some more important intelligence questions that are inspired by other types of systems like maybe i don't know swarm behaviors in fish or uh, right so i want to sort of destigmatize ai to not be just anthropocentric or human centric but to th to think of ai as a new form of intelligence um that looks also at animal intelligence human intelligence obviously but also, you know, create maybe in its own different idea of what intelligence is. And if you look at the, the definition of intelligence, it's mostly been defined as what humans do, right? And maybe that will be challenged with new developments of AI. So, so yeah, that's my sort of provocation on your question. But thank you very much for bringing this up. Good provocation. <laughs> Frank Siles uh, ask, uh, asks, uh, Professor Baraka has some example for using AI with virtual robots for decision making using databases. Databases. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, Professor Baraka has some uh, example of using AI with virtual robots for decision making using databases. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of examples of decision support systems in multiple domains. Um, we've been looking at some use cases recently. Um, so things like, you know, a fire brigade where you have, um, you know, an AI that helps, you know, a team coordinate or um, you have military decision support systems. You have uh, so any, any sort of um, AI uh, in the medical domain as well, right? And these are typically virtual systems, right? So they don't have a physical robot because you don't need one in this particular case. <coughs> now, if you mean by virtual robot that you have an actual character that is embodied um, and is able to uh, socially interact, um, that might be the case, I think, for people who are not tech savvy, people who do not necessarily want to use a, um, a computer in a way that requires you know, some technical knowledge then it would make a lot of sense to have a virtual agent that is able to maybe have a conversation with you, right? So think about it as a chatbot, but with a body and um, kind of a fancy version of the a little clipper um, that used to be in a Microsoft Office, right? Uh, and there's a lot of work on virtual agents and how they should... Uh, so there's a lot of overlap between virtual agents and social robots. Um, but a lot of the stuff that you can do on a virtual agent, you cannot do with a robot, or it's much harder to do on a robot. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Um, 
it's a matter of usability. In a lot of cases, a physical robot is much better. Um, and in other cases, it just doesn't make any difference. So you might as well go for a virtual version. Um, and decision support systems have been around for a long time. So I would say the combination of both is, is definitely a good idea in, in, some, in some cases. Uh, we have two related questions. Uh, one, Rodney, another Wellington. Rodney, what are the main future challenges uh, for this evolution of symbiotic learning? Wellington asks how much time it is going to need to see in the market robots with learning ability. So the first one is more about research challenges, right? And then the second one, second one is more of a of a market slash uh, um, implementation issue, right? Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, so I would say the biggest challenge for um, the symbiotic learning is less about developing algorithms that are about to deal with the complexity of the scenario and it's more really about modeling people that's been really one of the very difficult things to do um, so if you don't have a model of a, a good model of how people will behave or how they learn or as rodrigo was asking before that you are able to assess as an ai how much a person has learned um, then it becomes very difficult to actually achieve um, learning on the human side and also to help people teach the robot better. Um, so I would say that's the main uh, challenge to actually make this happen in the wild, right? That it's not in a lab setting where we have this very restricted scenario um, that you would just have these robots in people's houses and you would just tell them, hey, talk to the robot the way you want. And then the robot would be able to respond. And if it doesn't understand that it would teach the teacher how to teach better, right? This is a very different scenario than a very uh, controlled environment. So I would say the the most the biggest challenge would be to deal with all those complexities, right, in in human behavior and all those intricacies about how people naturally interact with robots. That to me is the hardest thing, um, and how to deal with all of that and how to incorporate that in learning. Um, now, in terms of being marketed, I think very soon. So right now, if you look at industry. Um, so it's always, let's say, a decade uh, too late, if, if not more, <laughs> right? So sometimes two decades uh, depends on the field. But right now, we already have, you know, learning from demonstration um, in most manufacturing robots. You know, you have a robot that you're able to teach. They call it the teaching um, mode where you basically, you know, show the robot what it's supposed to do. It's a bit of cheating because it's not real teaching. It's just record and replay. But... That's fine. It's a first step, right? We've got to start somewhere. Um, ideally, you know, you would want the robot to generalize from these demonstrations to. So I would say that is definitely the next step that is very marketable, that you would have robots that are able to, through a few examples, learn a more general task. And then the next step, I would say, would be to be able to both show the robot what to do and then to be able to refine or give it feedback through interaction. And that part, you know, if you look at Netflix or Instagram, it, it, we have lots of algorithms that learn from feedback, right? The technology is there, but it's all virtual and there's lots of data, right? And there's lots of people providing feedback. With a robot, you have one user, you need to learn their preference and you only have a few data points, right? So the, it's, it's a much harder learning problem because you, you need to learn from very little data, right? And one of the solutions might be to use knowledge, right? To use knowledge graphs or use some pre-existing knowledge to do some reasoning. So not just using deep learning, right? To so combining some more symbolic techniques with machine learning techniques. But that is an open research question at the moment, right? Um, and I think to go back to the market question, it will be a while until we can actually have this interactive learning robot that does sort of lifelong learning but for a programming robots through um, intuitive interfaces, I think that's going to be a matter of a few years before we see more advancement there. Unfortunately, we are ending this webinar. 
Now, um, the last question, Barak. I have a question about the philosophy of technology. Okay? <laughs> Very different. <laughs> Do you know uh, the seminal work from uh, Lick Lider about main computer symbiosis? If yes, uh, do you think it's still relevant today? So I'm not a philosopher, um, and I, I don't believe I know this author. I, I'm, I'm trying to find the name. Lick in the Lider. Sorry? Do you know work from Lick Lider about main computer symbiosis? Seminal paper from... Um, I don't think I know. I don't think I know this author, but I'd, I'd be very interested to, to read it. Um, okay. it's, um, yeah, so maybe, maybe you can ask a, a more specific question about maybe the main claim that this author made and I can try to see if it's, uh, I mean, I would say most of the work that has been written about AI before AI even is still relevant and will always be relevant. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure in, in particular. I'm going to write, uh, in chat a name. Okay. Uh, Licky Lider. And mm -hmm. uh, he has a paper named the main computer symbiosis. Okay. And this very, uh, like the work, uh, worked in IBM and the upper net and the, another companies and uh, was professor at uh, MIT. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and, um, um, uh, very important for my um, research about the main computer symbiosis. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, 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 I am immensely grateful to Professor Baraka for this amazing participation. Amazing. Uh, thank you so I, much also, I, I also thank you, Rodrigo, for his help in realization uh, of this webinar. Thank you. Uh, do you uh, have you some uh, words for our audience? Um, I just want to say th thank you for tuning in. Um, if you want to follow on my updates, I have a Twitter account where I post some research uh, updates. So feel free to follow me on there. I also have uh, LinkedIn that you can follow. Um, I try to, to communicate the latest publications and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I hope that uh, I was able to somehow be useful or maybe but perhaps inspiring in some parts of my talk uh, somehow. Uh, if at least one of you feels that way, then it's a win for me. Thank you, Baraka. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, everyone who come out. Until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>